Hello and welcome to The Game Changers, the podcast where you'll hear from extraordinary trailblazing women in sport. I'm Sue Anstis, a founding trustee of the Women's Sport Trust charity and the founder of Fearless Women, a company with a powerful ambition to drive positive change for women's sport. I'm delighted to say that this series of The Game Changers is supported by Sport England, who have done so much to tackle the inequalities women face across all areas of sport. From the wonderful This Girl Can campaign and initiatives that help shape school sport for girls to schemes that encourage more female volunteers in the workforce, support female coaches and officials and ensure more women from all backgrounds take leadership positions on the boards of our sports organisations. My guest today is the extraordinary Ebony Rainford Brent, a former England cricketer, World Cup winner sports broadcaster at the BBC and Sky, director of women's cricket at Surrey, motivational speaker and a podcast host. Is there no end to this woman's talents? I started the interview by asking Ebony if she could remember the first time she'd hit a cricket ball. It was quite powerful for me because I was about nine, ten years old. I was at primary school and I loved football so I knew nothing about cricket. I thought cricket was a weird sport. And I remember they said this guy called Tony Moody was coming in. He was a Jamaican kind of heritage guy, was teach cricket. But I remember being like, cricket, that's a bit weird. Like, what is that? What is it? And I was resistant. I remember being like, nah, don't fancy it. Uh, one of my teachers were like, look, just give it a go. It's something different. You love football, maybe try it. And I remember so clearly, like the first moment I hit the ball, it was like a plastic bat. We were on a concrete playing field and the orange ball flew out the cage. And I was like, <gasps> Wow. 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 Like I was just hooked. It was, I was hooked. So, um, that was it really. Once I hit my first ball and I was running around with all the boys in the playground, that was it. I was, I was in, I loved it. And what do you think, what do you think it was about it then? I said that, that sensation of hitting, but what else was it about the game as you started to play that you loved? Yeah. So we, I mean, we played street cricket for a long time, so it's very different to sort of your traditional game. So it was so fast paced, but I think what was different is, um, there were so many strategic things. So I remember just being like, right, if I want a wicket, I need to work this guy out. And it's different to football or basketball. Where you, yes, there's strategy, but you're moving, you've got plays. I think with cricket, I was able to go, right, how do I want to get this kid out? Or, or where do I want to hit this ball? And I think it was the, the just the ability to, within a game, have my own individual sort of strategy. So then you're thinking constantly, right, what if I do this? What if I try and spin it? What if I bowl it faster? I just found that I loved the um, the thinking process behind it. So it's a very strategic game and you could pick that up even in street cricket very quickly. That's really interesting. I've never thought of it from, from that side before. I've never, <laughs> played, never played cricket, that's probably why, isn't it? We'll get you, you there, did, we'll get you there. <laughs> you mentioned other sports as well and I, you've obviously uh, mentioned there basketball, but athletics and netball. And So did you play lots of sports at school? Yeah, so at secondary school in particular, I played netball, um, I played basketball, like English schools level, I played athletics, English school standard, squash, I played loads of sports, netball, I think the difference actually, there's one difference was, um, I remember there was a chance I could have possibly tried to creep into England basketball or England cricket as a sort of teenager, but there was a lady called Jenny Washer who became my like mentor, and she had her mindset on making me a cricketer, like she just did everything, she got me scholarships, she would drive me up to training all around the country. She was just amazing. So it was kind of her passion for keeping me hooked in the game that was the driver. Like I I, I love being around her so much and she was just so supportive. And I think because it was financially tricky as well for mum, that extra help towards the cricket kind of made it like, all right, you know, there's someone investing in me and, you know, why not? So even though I had a lot of other sports I possibly could have kicked on with a lot of those, it was cricket that, that ended up being the winner, I guess. Can you remember at what point you knew you were really good and you had great potential? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say, I remember the, the first time I got an England junior letter, so I was um, 14, and I remember I got this letter which said, you've been selected to join England Junior Training. And then it was addressed to Ebony Jewel Rainford Brent. And I went to my mum and I was like, mum, they've got the wrong person. Because I, di- I didn't think I was that good. And she was like, well, Ebony, I don't think there's any other Ebony Jewel Rainford Brent um, out there. And so I would say even like playing in England teams in my junior years, I didn't really know I was 
good. I don't know if I ever had that as a sort of a thought process. What I would say is I'm most probably dedicated myself later to it after injuries because I was just so passionate about trying. But I don't think I ever had that thought process like I am good at this. This is something I could thrive until much later, maybe even into my sort of early 20s. It was a it just wasn't really a thought process for me. Just enjoying it. Mm. And you you grew up in in Brixton and family life growing up was difficult. Are you okay to talk about your brother? And yeah, what yeah, there? not yeah, definitely. Without going into too much detail, but I can give you sort of snapshot. Um, so yeah, we grew up in sort of Hearn Hill Way, Brixton, um, and you know I think it was those days was early days of knife crime. So you know now I think it's maybe much more common. But then it was you know it was difficult. I was about five years old and he was. 16 at the time and it was someone he knew through school and growing up and it was just a an argument between them I think my understanding is it's over a girl that they were both interested in and the guy plotted planned and yeah stabbed him a number of times and it's something that maybe I'm processed now as an adult I think it's taken me a long time to process but it's um it's the sort of thing that happens within poorer communities. I think if people understand the sort of dynamics of what does happen and why it happens, you know, it, it makes more sense when you're in it. But it, it's, yeah, it's something that I rocked us. It rocked me emotionally for years. I think sport was actually my release. Um, you know, it, it hit our family hard. I would say it's taken us till now, I would say. And that's a long time later from five years old to to kind of recover and process losing someone in such a tragic manner and so young. And I know it might not kind of relate directly to a lot of people's experience, but I think we've all had like a sudden loss sometimes and a sudden loss in a shocking way is just, it's really hard to deal with. So yes, yeah, so it was a sad thing for our family and something that you know, I, I really feel for families who are going through that now because I don't think you can get over those sort of experiences at all. And family-wise, so you've got two brothers now. You're still close to as a family unit now coming yeah, out? Yeah, kind of. Um, one brother's been inside for a long time. We haven't really had much contact. I'm not sure what he's up to now, but we're estranged as such. And then another brother I'm really close with, yeah, Dom. So we speak most days and he's been... Most probably one of the, even though we argue, I don't know about you guys, like we have that sort of fiery sort of relationship, but he's also been, you know, one of my biggest supports, buying me spikes when I needed it as a kid through to helping me get my first flat. He's that sort of practical brother who just gets stuff done for you. So, yeah, I've been been really lucky to have him in my life. And cricket's, I mean, cricket's such a white middle class sport in huge mm. contrast, really, to multicultural city, really, where you grew up or grew up in Brixton. Did you feel like you belonged? You talked about street cricket initially, but as you moved mm. into the more traditional format, did you feel like you belonged in the cricket world? No, definitely not. And I mean, I've spoken more recently um, about my experiences. I never really felt like I belonged. It was such a different world. And I think the values, the experiences, um, you know, my friends at home were everything white, black, Asian, very diverse. And you never really had to think about your colour. I never thought about my colour in my home world because everyone just understood everyone just by the nature of being in such a multicultural environment. And then cricket is very different it's um a higher socioeconomic class traditionally it's um white and I was the only black girl who took the first black woman to play for England so you just kind of went through and I think you know I've spoken about there's been a mixture of experiences which I mostly won't go into too much because I feel like I've exhausted myself recently talking about BLM <laughs> yeah. but yeah I've had some you know I've, I've had my racist experiences which were difficult which makes you feel more isolated and alone and I maybe didn't have the confidence at those days to um you know speak up or challenge and things like that so it was always a uh how do you describe it it's just always something that you felt like you you felt it and it was a lonely feeling of just not quite being part but I I did stay with the game I love the game I'm grateful now that I'm doing a lot of projects which is trying to look at making the game more diverse because I think we we need to to make the game reach out more like football does, netball does, basketball does, athletics, um, even rugby, which was an elitist sport like cricket has started to shift more. So, you know, I want cricket to be one of those sports because I know what it feels like to realise that, that, you know, there's a, a lack of difference in our game. And why do you think more girls haven't come through the path in the way that you did? So obviously they came into your school, they inspired you mm. and you started playing. So why were there not more Eben is that followed around your time, do you think? So mine was complete potluck. So the lady I spoke about, Jenny, um, 
she spotted me when I was about 10 by chance at this sort of competition where it was, they had to have a girl. So I think I got roped in like <laughs> to be the, come on, there's a girl, get her in. And she saw me at this. I remember her going to my mum and doing all the sort of selling, come on, let's get her in. She got me to Surrey, et cetera. If you look at the pathways, which I, you know, I'm starting to do a lot more work looking at, it's not connected from inner city to our traditional game. It's not at all. The, you know, all the kids playing street projects, there aren't talent ID processes. There aren't um, academies which will help those kids move from softball to hardball. Mm. Um, there's not enough investment. There's investment in grassroots programs in those areas, but the, the pathway is not linked up. And so for me, Jenny did all that. She did the the hard yards, but I know from ex coaching, I've been into, I remember going into Loughborough Junction, Mitesfield estate, which is just down the road from where I grew up. And I would say the most talented girl I've ever seen in my entire life. I'd never played before. I asked her to pick up and do this throw. She threw down the stumps like quick. She was quick. So I moved the stumps and I kept moving it back and back and back <laughs> and challenging us and go on. And she was hit, she, she was hitting down one stump every single time. She'd never played before. And I remember speaking to her mum. Her mum had a number of kids, was working two or three jobs. And I said, look, I want to get her involved. And the challenge was the times of the training, the location was in Guildford, which That's is cool. miles away. You know, we tr and I try, we tried. I remember us trying to make it happen, but without someone who could physically get the girls to the training, it was just too much for a mum with you know, all these other challenges. And so I think that's the problem with our game is that, you know, whereas football is much more, you can play within your community and get better and there's opportunities on your doorstep. Cricket is just, you know, it's more based around the traditional club. So, you know, I'm doing a lot of work. Hopefully you'll hear in the next um, six months or so some projects that I'm working on because I, I feel that we can really break down those barriers if we invest in them. Excellent, excellent. You do, and I feel, you see this incredible women's teams from India and Pakistan and, and yet in the UK, in the South Asian communities, we're just not seeing those girls coming through at all. So uh, Yeah, massively. It's it's a, I'm going to stay optimistic and say it's the potential of growth is ridiculous. It just now needs the investment and the willing. And I think there is investment around the South Asian community, but then the other bits, it's like the willingness to want them. So I don't know if you've heard, we just started an ACE Academy at Surrey, yes, which is, Surrey, stands yeah. for Afri yeah, African Caribbean Engagement Program. And we've gone out looking for diverse talent. Like we're looking for it and we're developing it. And I think you've just got to go looking for the talent and help them progress through. Excellent. That's well, good luck. We look forward to hearing a bit more of that in the months ahead as well. So I guess back to your playing, you suffered a big career upset at 19 when you were mm. on that pathway. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened there? Yeah, I got my back. Oh man, I would say it was it's one of the tougher experiences of my life really. Um I went I went to an England trials kind of it wasn't official trials, but I got called up to join the full England side. I remember being so like, right, this is my time to impress. I'm gonna bowl fast. I was a bowler those days. I'm gonna run in, I'm gonna do everything, charge in. And I turned up and I bowled like a couple of balls and I was like, Oh, my back feels a bit weird. Uh, but you think just suck it up, suck it up. And I bowled a couple more and I was like, Oh, there's something off. And I found a way to just excuse myself. And I remember getting back in my Ford Fiesta, one of my favourite ever cars, actually, that old school Ford Fiesta. <laughs> Bombed it back down the motorway. Um, I was living with my boyfriend at the time. I got in, I remember just sort of saying, oh, my back's a bit dodgy. And I bent out down to pick up the remote and I just collapsed. And I never really walked properly from that point. It turns out I had like a pass defect in the spine, two prolapsed discs. There was all these problems, which I suppose I knew there was back problems, but they'd never quite been diagnosed, even when I saw physios, et cetera. Because of the stage, we weren't fully professional at that stage. So there weren't, how do you describe it? They, were, they weren't like... Well, like sports science support. Sport, and like, yeah, yeah, none yeah, of that. Yeah. So we went through the slow NHS. They did MRI scans. I remember the doctor telling me that I might, you know, might never play sport again and um, the amount of damage that, you know, I needed to be concerned about, like, all sorts of things. And, you know, when it was just the panic of the moment, I just was like, I'm going to lose sport. I couldn't sit up properly, so I had to leave university. I was studying chemistry at UCL. I left university for a year and pretty much just laid on my back for a year, if I'm honest. Like, I tried a bit of treatment here. Nothing was working. I tried a physio. Nothing was working. Um, so I just kind of went into a dark place and I thought that was it. I thought my life was over. My brother that I spoke about earlier, that's the one that we we are like firecrackers <laughs> but also supporters. I remember it was about a year in of, so I mean, I put on loads of weight. I was sitting in dark rooms. I was just watch, eating angel cake and watching Homes Under the Camera. 
in our basement flat and he called me one day and he just effed and blind. He was like, <laughs> if you've given up, you've given up, you've this, you've that, sort it effing out. And I was like, yeah, but Dom, the diagnosis and what the doctors is, he said, and he was like, F that, are you going to just accept that as your reality or are you going to try something different? Are you going to, and I was like, whatever. And between that and my mum had shoved all these motivational CDs from a guy called Tony <laughs> Robbins. So I started like, he, he kind of sparked me mentally and I started listening to these guru tapes. Um, Actually, Tony Robbins swears a bit as well, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. He doesn't mind an F-bomb or two, does he? Um, You've got it both sides. So yeah, exactly. So I think it was the two, the two things at that time were my brother kind of shaking me up and then listening to the tapes, and then I made goals, and I was like, I want to come back, and I want to play for England. I want to get my master's in chemistry, and I wrote it up on the wall, and I kind of just stared at it for a few weeks. Nothing really happened, and then I decided to start thinking differently, and I um, I started looking for alternative types of treatment, acupuncture, chiropractors, all that sort of stuff, and I finally found, after a number of trials, a chiropractor who just, the minute he saw me, was like, I can sort you out. I know exactly what's going on. He, he adjusted me. I started seeing him three or four times a week, and imagine going from not walking properly to like walking and you're like, oh my yeah. God, oh my God. So it's a process. It took three or four years. You know, I'd love to say it was an overnight thing. It was, you know, he got me back to walking first year properly, then running. And then, then by the time I was kind of ready to play sport and my brother funded that as well, then the funding was available through, you know, some university initiatives and sports initiatives. So that was it. I then got back. So it was, it was tough. I have to say mentally, you know, to have a year pretty much laying on your back. And just putting on weight and feeling hopeless was is a dark place. Um, yeah. But equally, I most probably learned how to get out of a dark place. And that's a really good thing that I think is um, a powerful skill. And as you were coming back, did you know that cricket, you would come back to cricket? Was that your driving force to kind of get you back and recovered? Yeah, it was. World Cup. And that's what I, my mum found the papers because I used to write a lot of goals down. I remember it was just thinking about... I want to be part of that World Cup. And it was four years away. It was the one we ended up going on to win in. Um, so it was four years away from when I wrote it. And it seemed like a bit of a pipe dream, but it was also just the what if, the thought of what if I could get back, what if. That was the thing that that drove me. Um, and I knew if I was able to get back to playing to an international standard, I would have got my body back to a reasonable amount of health. So it was like a driver of like, can I work out and push myself? And, you know, my back's still not perfect. I have to do a lot of work on it, but, um, but I still, I'm still glad that I, I went through that process. Absolutely. And when did you make your full debut for England? My full debut, so 2007 was my first debut, even though we've got a cap for some stuff we played as junior kid, but that was my first proper debut, 2007, and the World Cup we won was 2009. And you mentioned earlier that you were the first black woman to play for England. So mm. when did you realise you were kind of making history? How did that feel at the time? Yeah, it was weird. It was weird. I remember, so our media manager at the time, a lady called Imogen, it was when we were in Chennai and we were out there and she just said, Ebony, I... I don't know if it's me, but I think you might be the first black woman. I was like, nah, you know, you're like, nah, it's 2000 and, <laughs> you know, it's 2007. And I'm Seven. thinking, you know, I live in, in an environment which is all sorts of people. I was like, no, no, just check it. And then when she told me, I was kind of, I was half embarrassed because I think they made a little announcement um, or sort of put it in in the, the notes somewhere. And I remember just feeling a little bit embarrassed because I, I kind of, didn't feel like oh this is amazing I felt like why are there not more I just yeah. um I wanted there to be more so I was a little bit embarrassed like when people talked about it I was like mm, yeah I, I am and I didn't sort of embrace it I didn't own it I think it's only now as an adult that I'm like okay look this is cool and it's something that I can leverage to say look let's bring more in but at that time mm -hmm. playing when you're the only one as well and like saying it in the team it wasn't like everyone was like oh that's really cool it would have just been a bit like okay, why is, you know, why are they making a big thing? So it wasn't a thing that I embraced for a long time. I felt a bit awkward. Um, wasn't celebrated by a media making... No, not really. Camp, no, we um, weren't. And our media was kind of so limited then just to did they win, did they lose? And <laughs> that was it. There was no extra narrative or, you know, um, attention at that, that stage. So, you know, and Sophia Dunkley, who was the next player um, a couple of years ago, so it's been 11 years between me and her so she's not regular in the team but she played a couple of matches that had a little bit more traction which was nice just to see that progression because the stories are now out there and um hopefully she can keep flying the flag and more more to come yeah, and more well. a lot more yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 
cricket uh, doesn't really have a particularly good reputation in terms of its uh, male-female balance in the past. But do you think Claire Connor's appointment as president of the MCC is a sign that things are changing in the right direction there? Massively. I mean, her as an individual anyway has done so much for the game. You know, I'm thinking as soon as she came in, she got a chance to shine contracts, which means the girls could work part time. Then she got it to professionalism. You know, we see in laws. She's done so much. And I think if there was ever a space um, and anyone who watched the final of the Women's World Cup in 2017 would have seen a packed stadium but the pavilion where the members were was empty. And it was just, and you knew people were gagging for tickets. There were people outside the ground. And you're just thinking, you know, if that was a men's World Cup final, it'd been absolutely rammed. And it showed, I guess, to the world who looked at the diversity of the crowd, the families, the kids, it was so beautiful. And then just to see that whole was kind of a reminder of where the, that sort of side of the game is. And what's good about Claire Connor's appointment is she knows how to go into a boardroom or a, a tricky environment and make change. She's done that. And I think, you know, MCC making that, I think that's an important statement. Not only is her, she's credible in her own right, and I think to do with gender, she's credible in her own right, but also that's a, a point from them to show, I think, that they're thinking forward. They know they need change and she would be the perfect person to do it. Excellent. And just to go back to 2009, rather, you mentioned you were obviously part of the winning team at the World Cup. Did you go into that tournament thinking you could win? Not you personally, but as a Yeah, as a, but team. As a unit. Yeah, we did. Do you know what was really interesting? So when I made my debut 2007, we lost every single game in that tournament, except I think the last one when the results had been decided. And it was a really painful experience. I mean, you know, the excitement of, oh my God, this is my first tournament and we saw ourselves as a team that could p- compete and we couldn't. It was a f- World Series, so it was Australia, New Zealand, India and us, who were meant to be the best four teams in the world. And we were completely outplayed. I just remember us being like, this is this is not good. Like, we're nowhere near where we need to be. And we got the World Cup in two years. We got no chance. Charlotte Edwards, our captain, was like, look, guys, we need to scrap and change everything. We had like a change of management. The players got shaken up. There were a few F-bombs at times in the change rooms, everything you <laughs> need to kind of shake up the environment. But we, what was so fascinating is how like the new lens of we were like, right, we've got pretty much 18 months to get our acts together. And we all worked out exactly what our role was. And my role was interesting because I was at that stage an opening batter because my bowling had kind of gone because I'm a back down the way. So opening batter, but also I knew I might not play every game. So I knew my role was also to bring energy. If I was not playing, I have to bring energy to the field, to the bringing on the drinks, to the supporting your teammates. So everyone got clear, like, what is my role on the field? What is my role off it? Um, What do we need to do to click? And we just kind of started finding this flow. And then we went on this unbeaten run up into the World Cup of nearly 20 games where it just clicked. So I think by that point, turning up to the tournament, we thought, you know what, we can do this. We've, We've worked out what we need to do. We've got the management right. We've got the roles and responsibilities right. And and so we did. We did believe it. We went there with a real belief. Um, it's, I would say it's one of the most surreal experiences for me because I've been in work environments and team environments, et cetera. But it was almost we got to the point that we were so clear and everyone believed and everyone was 100% like behind it that it, there was no arrogance, but it was just like – it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. We're just going to do what we've been doing and it's going to work. So yeah, we, by the time we hit the world cup, I think we knew it. And that whole year, world cup, world T20 in the ashes, we just went on a run. I mean, we fell off a cliff a little bit after that, but at least that, (laughs) that year was incredible. It was really incredible. Did you have psychologists working with you then in terms of mental attitude for the team as well? Yeah, in and out, you know, we, we had, now it's, you know, much more of a staple thing in the teams. That stage, it was, some players really embrace it. Someone like Claire Taylor, who's uh, one of the greatest players that we've ever had in our women's game globally, but she's was part of that team. She was someone who very much embraced it and she would seek it out. Some of us young players, we would do the occasional kind of group session, but a bit like, what is that? I mean, I've now become an obsessive about sort of mindset yeah. and psychology, but at that stage you could take it a little bit and not take it if you didn't want to and the some players really embraced it but now you know you see how it's all evolved and it's it's a very common thing that everyone embraces psychology now but then it was a bit hit or miss I was a bit like "Eh, what is this and then when I saw us win and I saw Claire Taylor do everything she did and then she gave me a book the habits of highly effective people by Stephen Covey (laughs) and after I read that then I was like 
oh wow, there's like a whole another world, and I think that that just opened up the 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 mindset for me. And how did that win affect women's cricket in the UK at the time? So back in two thousand and seven. Oh God, it's it's had so many impacts. I think before that, you know, like I was saying, people might just report on a result or or loss like somewhere at the bottom of a website and a in a page after that it was the first time like we I remember we made front pages on a couple of big newspapers and it started to be talked about I think the men weren't doing so well so then it became a not that we wanted to ever compete but it came out oh well the women doing all right what's going on with the men and then that created a dialogue should we invest more and what then from that moment happened was investment I think people realized The country enjoyed the success of a female team, um, the team that could be very successful for a long time. um, And it's worth investing in it. And so, you know, Claire Connor had not only a platform of who she was, but she had a platform of success to work with. Individually, it changed lives. Me and Isha Gua, who retired not long after that, all of a sudden having a World Cup title, it was like, oh, why don't we get them on to commentate on a game or two? which has then turned into a whole career that's forged pathways. And it gives you credibility, even if, you know, I wasn't the best player in the world. People don't (laughs) mind hearing from a woman if you've, you know, won a World Cup. So it did, it did change careers individually. So I'd say everything has kind of progressed. And then the 2017 win at home, I think was the complete flip point for real. Like, right, this is, this is the next level in women's sport. I think that packed house at Lord's, summed up to a lot of people what the potential is for the women's game excellent and you mentioned there that not long after you retired so when did you know that your career was was coming to an end yeah there's a bit of a funny story about this Isha Gua has a lot to be um to (laughs) to (laughs) answer for answer for for, yeah so what happened is um well a few things I was having a bit of a bad time in the team around sort of 2010 I'd got injured a really freak accident of just stepping back on a ball did something to my ankle, still went on tour, but in pain and just not enjoying the team environment at that point. And I ended up coming back and having an operation and had about six months out of the game. And it was the first time in my life I didn't just care about cricket. I was like, oh, I've got friends. Oh, I've got family. Oh, I could go out and party. Oh, you know, and I started to like think about, it was the first time having six months off just doing, you know, normal stuff that I had a chance to think about the real world. I started doing some work experience. I was working for a charity called Laws Taverners part-time. And I guess I realized I could find fulfillment outside, like things that gave me the same amount. So I started thinking about it for a while, but I wasn't sure. And I remember calling Isha. We Skyped. She was in India. And I was like, mate, I think I'm thinking about retiring. I gave her this whole chat. She was like, no, no, stick with it, mate. Stick with it. Um, you, you've got to dig in another five years. you got this. I'm, I want you to stay. I want to play with you. So I was like, all right, all right, all right. So I was like, okay, but he just dig in. He's just told you to dig in. And then a week later, she called me up and she was like, mate, just so you know, there's an announcement coming out tomorrow. I'm done. I was like, what? (laughs) You're out? And she was like, yeah, I'm done. I'm out. I'm out. So then I was like, what? So she announced her retirement. And then I was like, right, if she's gone, I'm gone. (laughs) And I was like, right, I'm out. So we retired within a week of each other. But I think it was was coming. It was knowing that – I think that happens with an athlete. You're so single-minded for so much of your career – and then a lot of people I've spoken to, it's like this moment where you kind of a lens of you want to be doing other stuff. And it's the minute that your brain starts to kind of kind of just disappear. You know, you're in the nets and you're not quite concentrating. That never happened to me before. And I just knew, I just knew it was time to go. I think I realized I wanted to do other things. And, and, and it was definitely the right moment for me. And you started commentating. So was that initially on women's cricket and then across to men's? Yeah, it was um it was fun. So when I retired, I didn't that day I didn't have a plan, I didn't have a focus. And about a week or so later, I was on Streatham Common Station and my phone rang, unknown number, and it was like, Hi, I'm Adam Mount from, from BBC. I heard you're interested in commentary. And I was like, I don't remember telling anyone that, but yeah, yeah, I am, I am, I am. And it was like, you know, you just blag it, like, yeah, I'm well up. I've always wanted to do it. It's this is my number one dream. And um <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember the plan was only for us to do a couple of women's games that they were going to cover that summer. Me and Isha both did it um, with two guys, Charles Dagnall, Kevin Howes. And then I think they were so happy. They thought it was actually these these women are all right, that they just put us straight in. We did the Australian men's ODIs that summer. There was no announcement, which I like. There wasn't a sort of, here comes the women or anything like that, which I've seen in other parts of the world. It was just, we think you're good enough. Give it a go, no training. And that was it. So I ended up sort of doing that. And then 
within no time, it was like men's cricket took over. I was doing 70, which is kind of like now, it's 80% men's cricket, 20% women. So, you know, I've been really fortunate to get the opportunity and then it just seems to have just flown. Um, so I say timing, you know, when sometimes timing in life, you know, we could have tried to, we could have tried to make a career of it 10 years before and nothing would have happened. But I think timing, people were ready for different voices. And it's interesting, you say, you, instead of having no training, so you just, with your expertise, you got there and away you went. Yeah, I think I think there's a few things. I would say, look, I haven't really had much traditional training. I think my first proper session was about a year ago, and then I found out all the mistakes I've been making for the last 10 years. <laughs> um, and I'm quite a kinesthetic learner. I like to go in and just listen and feel anyway. But what I would say is there's no doubt how much the playing the game helps. You know, not every commentator is a... Um, player but what I found is even in a tricky moment where I'm not sure what to say or I'm bubbling from babbling from my words you just say what you see which gets you out of a hole for a little while so that grounding in playing I think kind of gave us a a little bit of breathing room because you could at least just understand what was happening in the game quite well enough to or put yourself in that position you know you could say right that batter at the crease I know what they're thinking they're trying to work the ball between this you know that becomes an and then, you know, you calm down and you realise, OK, I need to improve my broadcasting. You start to listen to others and their styles. I speak very quickly. I've had to, I spend all my life trying to slow myself down, which has always been my challenge. But, yeah, no training. And I think it depends on different people and different personalities. But I quite like it. I like just getting in and learning on the job. And are you a different commentator now to where you were 10 years ago? If you listen back to yeah. those at all. Oh, God, I heard. So BBC, they do, there's a programme and they pulled out my first ever piece of commentary and my voice sounded like, hi, I'm Emily. <laughs> <laughs> and it, <was> just, <laughs> it sounded like a smurf or something. Um, yeah, so I think my voice has changed. It's definitely a bit fuller and a bit deeper. I can tell the difference when I'm confident, when I'm not, because when you're confident, you speak with a little bit more space, you emphasise your words. Whereas early days where you're not sure, and I would still say that creeps in now when you're, you know, starting a series or you haven't commentated for a while. I speak too quickly and you just flow through. So I think the, the difference is the, the depth in the voice. It's like I'll say things with a bit more authority and um, I structure my points a little bit better now than I did then. But I still feel like there's so long, long, long way to go. And TV as well now is is another dimension with talk back and directors in your ears and looking at different cameras and all that. Um, there's definitely loads more to keep learning. I love learning. It's good, great to keep developing and learning. It more, is. It? And obviously f- female commentators and pundits face some pretty brutal backlash, especially in sports like football. Have you faced much of that at all in, in cricket? Luckily, the nature... we I have, definitely have. I've had uh, a number of comments um, around skin colour, around gender, you know, no one cares, get off the... You know, whatever it is. But I would say it's 95% love. And also, I've learned to sort of step back from social media, even though I'm active on it, like emotionally not get connected so much. So... Alex Scott, for example, I know football, you know, you read sometimes the tweets and you just think, but it's a different beast. It's a different, it's more tribal football. And I think it attracts more, um, you know, hate online just generally. And I would say that's not even just to her as a female. You see it just through football. Because cricket, yeah. people do tweet badly, but it's just a slightly different style. Um, if anything, people try and over-intellectualise this week. Um, and this was on Twitter, but someone wrote a piece and, their comment about me and Isha is that we use glottal stops so we don't pronounce our words the way they like. And I was just like, well, you know, you, you can intellectualise uh, the comment, but, you know, it's different to, I would say, you know, football, you see some real just raw, nasty stuff. So nasty, yeah. I just do my best to ignore ignore it. I'm much better. Sometimes I use filters. I use filters. I don't know if anyone else does, but Twitter, you can sometimes filter just to see replies from people that you know. So if I've got a busy period and I just don't want to be bothered by dodgy comments, then I just turn it off so you just don't see it. That's good to know that. Actually, we should let some of our younger female athletes who are working with yeah, women's definitely do that. that too. Yeah. And you've mentioned there, but it's wonderful to see so many women in cricket media now. And I, I was lucky enough to interview Ellie Oldroyd last week. And I guess with her and then Alison, and you mentioned mm. Isha and you in terms of the coverage for the like, latest test. Do you feel things are moving significantly in the right direction for women's Yeah, media massively, commentary? massively. I think there's so much like, first of all, Ali, I think, was someone who, the, the direct producer who called us, I think Ali had spoken to them like a while back and said, look, when these girls retire, get them in. 
the one thing I would say um, was I always knew seeing Alison and Ellie before us in that space, even though I didn't know them personally that well at the time, but I'd seen them. It was kind of like, ah, oh, it's okay because there's a couple. Then, you know, me and Issa on the analyzing side, they were more on the, the presenting side at that stage. But I, I already felt possibility because I could see it. You know, you, you kind of need to see something before you believe it. Then, like, you go forward to 2017 World Cup and it was an all-women female team with high-quality broadcasters that are working in men's and women's cricket around the world. You know, Mel Jones from Australia, one of the greatest broadcasters, male or female, full stop. Um, Natalie Jamana from South Africa. You know, when you look around a team, you're like, wow, this is a milestone. Not only are we an all-female team, but we're also a high-quality female team of women working across sport, just regardless of its gender. And that kind of mentally just cemented to me how far the game's come. I still think there's a long way to go. I'd love to see more written journalists, female journalists. I think we've got some and, you know, Telegraph's women's sport doing so, but I'd love to see more. The the only thing I would say is you still do walk into the media centre. And I think the commentary box has improved, but you still, when you look across the mass, the written journalists, there's a long way to go still there. Absolutely. And like, would you like to do more outside of sport? So in terms of other entertainment and other programmes, is media yeah. your passion now? Yeah, I really love media. I think, um, I don't know, I'm quite a bubbly person. Well, I don't know if I sound like it on a podcast today, but I genuinely am a bubbly person. I love being around people and I love creative things. I would love to move into other spaces. I think recently I've just sort of pitched a couple of documentaries which are linked to sport and some social issues, which, you know, fingers crossed, I think they might get some traction but then that to me is like an opening door of like one trying to help work together to put a program together and then two if you do that and you do sport and social I love social issues and and tackling challenges then I'd love to do a documentary which maybe takes something a little bit further so I'd love to move into it I'm maybe less of a a reality TV ish. Um, <laughs> not yeah, not that, that dancing this Christmas or anything. Or... Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. You'd maybe consider it, but that's not my natural kind of direction. Yeah. But I think um, I'd love to get into to programs and even actually behind the scenes a little bit on putting program and program ideas together as well. And aside from the media work, you're obviously really active within the man- management of cricket as well. So can you tell mm. me a little bit more about your role at Surrey? Yeah, definitely. So um, given a role five or six years ago, director of women's cricket, it was really, you know, great from us, our county that they just saw that women's cricket was growing, but they wanted someone to come in and have a real focus. So it was not only looking at the performance strand and how we can, you know, improve the performance. By the way, I'm just going to say today that our Surrey women have won two trophies already this summer. I'm just so excited. Um, so we just have to give a shout out to Hannah Jones, the captain and everybody. But um, one was to get the performance up, but actually it was more to integrate women's cricket within the, the club because we have a commercial team, marketing team, uh, finance, etc., and women's cricket kind of sat over there on a shelf somewhere, and I think the club wanted us to bring it in. So it was a lot of, you know, getting to know everybody across the whole club and get them caring about women's cricket. And it took a few years; it took a couple of years just to get it on everybody's lens. But now my role is much more hands off around the women's game. I sit on the board, so then you can push agendas. For example, this year with COVID we were able to talk about we want women's cricket to be the first back. And we were the first game that Surrey played male or female. We streamed it under lights at the Oval. It can bring up agendas around diversity. So, yeah, that role has changed. It's um, it's much more sort of step back and strategic now, whereas when I first started, it was very much hands-on and trying to, like, get everybody caring. But now we're looking at, you know, how can we leverage and grow the, the women's game? And, you know, I know that we're both interested about commercialising um, the game, and I think there's a lot more we can do there as a as a club. So I'm focusing on some of those sort of uh, lenses now. And was elite coaching that pathway ever something you seriously considered? Yeah, good question. I've done some badges, and I started doing my level three, but I don't have enough patience. You know, I. <laughs> I get so emotionally involved. Whenever I sit on the bench, the players were just like, Ebony, shut up. Like, <laughs> like you're just a bit too keen. I think it takes, you know, coaching, and that's one thing, you, you know, you've got to know your strengths and weaknesses, right? I think coaching takes a certain level of patience, allowing someone to develop in their own space. And, and, and sometimes that means you can't fast track them. They've got to find their own way. And I get so frustrated because I just want to be like, right, just do this and do that. And I realize that, that that's not quite the best coaching mentality. I think I'm much better in a management role. But I think when I got to coaching, I just almost 
went too far and got too emotionally involved and that's not quite the skill set you need you know my best coaches have had this ability to kind of give you that little bit of insight when you need it but then step back and let you grow and I just struggled with that balance I was just always so I can help somebody one-to-one with ideas which I've done you know I think you could try playing this shot or that shot but not so much day-to-day it wasn't quite my skill set and what's your balance of your time? I guess it's different at the moment in COVID, mm. but in terms of your media work, you do, you know, you're working with charities, you're working with the club, you're doing motivational speaking. So yeah. how, do how does it all work? That? The balance is n- non-existent. I think it's more of a lifestyle. So what I mean by that is when I started with Surrey stuff, I was already doing my media. So my media was my main focus. So we knew that I was starting. So we said, look, let's try one day a week in the office them with you know emails and stuff like that around whereas now I would just say it's a lifestyle I most probably talk every day to say you know I was on the phone a moment ago I've got projects to write it's just a lifestyle I I've never really been someone who clocks time and I think that's a useful thing in the jobs that I do because my media is maybe on paper 80% of my work but then I'd say my sorry stuff might be 30% you know, and that's going over, then you do a talk and then you do with it. So I've had to learn to get my time managed better. As you might know, I've got um, someone who looks after my diary, actually, which is helps me structure my life. Like I've tried to put things in blocks so I can get time to think about things or time to work around traveling and schedules. So I would say every job is mostly overdoing what it says on paper and it's more of a lifestyle than a job there's no sort of Monday to Friday and then you switch off for to-do days I don't think I've ever had that I'll be on I'll be on tour in New Zealand writing strategy documents for Surrey or something like that it's that sort of lifestyle and you have your own podcast so The Art of Mm. Success which I love and it gave me lots of inspiration thank you for listening starting this this podcast too um so how much did you learn I mean I love doing Mm. these podcasts but how much did you learn from talking to other people and some amazing guests you've had as well yeah some amazing people everyone from people like Alistair Campbell to Richard Osman who's TV amazing producer from Endemol athletes all sorts I learned so much I think um I think the first thing I learned about is like failure. I mean, we all know it and we know that you, you've you got to be okay with failure. And I was so scared even just to start doing it. But then every time I listened to someone, you could just hear the failures through their story, but how they just kept going and going and testing. And, and that was resilience really is just going despite fears or despite and I think it kind of reinforced for me like it's part of life I also the other thing which uh, you know I did a little summary episode once but strategy I couldn't believe how strategic thinking so many people were Alistair Campbell well he was a spin doctor as such but he's he talked about how he viewed a lot of things and it opened my mind to strategy Richard Osman sitting down and talking to him and I realized how strategic thinking athletes were talking about how they built their careers And it made me think about creating more space for planning and vision. Where do you want to go? What's the next step? What's further than that? And I would say also purpose. Like everybody seemed to have a purpose behind what they were working towards. So I learned loads from doing it. And I would say actually just organizing yourself and getting it done, as I'm sure you know what it's like. And this technology is better than how I started doing it. It was um, definitely struggling and like, how'd you get this done? And then, oh, sorry, I forgot to press record. And, you know, <laughs> I'm sure you had those challenges, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Are you are you planning to write a book at the time? Is that still yeah, something in the pipeline? It's in the pipeline. I just don't know when amongst all the things. I've, I've got like a couple of like loose chapters. I need to give it to someone actually to kind of take the sections from the book with what they've done and kind of mirror mirror it. I just haven't organized myself, but maybe I need to just get that back on the agenda. It's a to-do. It's a definite to-do. I just, (laughs) when, ah, getting it done. (laughs) I'm going to bring that, brings you to your bucket list. I've heard about this amazing bucket list that you've got done. Has has COVID slowed down your progress or are you? Oh man, yeah. I got one done just before I flew into like, Fiji, going to Fiji uh, Island Hopping was one of them. Um, and I got that done. But I've been obsessed. I've been obsessed with my bucket list maybe six years. I wrote out, what, 83 things I think it is that I wanted to do. I did it. Do you know why I did it? it was I was ending my cricket career and, and I was realizing like I haven't been anywhere. I haven't. I'd not even been to, well, I'd been to Paris like as a kid, but, you know, I hadn't really been anywhere. Um, I hadn't done anything. I hadn't started learning anything. And so I just put loads of things on there. Golf, I wanted to, you know, I want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I wanted to, you know, so I just wrote 
a load of things that I want to do. I wanted to be in a flash mob, which I've done, which isn't was just so much fun. <laughs> it gives me focus so that you know I've got a, I've got a to do th- list that pops up once a month and just sort of says right, what adventure are you planning? Yeah, it's so a document- it's a do- documentary in itself, isn't it? We can yeah, follow maybe there is. Bucket list. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I'd love to. Oh my god, that's a good idea. Right, writing that one down. <laughs> but I think it's so important. I think it is important. We should definitely all just make sure we carve out time to do just those one or two things that are on our dream list. I love it. And and actually, um, I sort of heard that playing the drums. Actually, playing the drums is on my bucket list. And I've is a couple it? times friends have said, "Why don't you just get started?" It's like, oh yeah, at some point in the future. So I love that you're doing that. How's that going? Do you know? I would say that the 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 thing that I'm learning to get in these things done is that you've just got to be in your eye line, right? So you know, working out. If I can't see my workout kit or the weights or my bike, which I use, I'm just not working. If it has, if it's hard work, you're just not doing it. So I would say get a little pad or kit and just chuck it in your living room or something where like mine is, that's mine's right by my sofa and you just walk past it. So then every now and then you're like, oh, I might just jump on. So it's, it's so much fun. And I, I go down to proper drum studios. I've got like all the proper gear and play maybe every couple of weeks, just a stress relief of just hitting things as loud as possible. Possible. it's um it's the best fun and have you shared your bucket list anywhere is there anywhere people can it's go on my website see? yeah oh, it is actually, good. sorry i should know that shouldn't i then <laughs> no, no no it's all right i don't know if that, it's on a few tabs in but um yeah and i think i've crossed off i might need to do an update but i've crossed off quite a few so i've maybe done about 20 or so so yeah if anyone's interested go and check it out yeah. uh, someone actually so i'd wanted to have a breakfast on the shard and someone saw it and just got in touch and was like oh i just looked at your bucket list come along so if anyone can help me <laughs> i'll put that Put that in the show notes as well. Okay? Yeah, Once exactly. Head along. Inspiration or for suggestions. Um, and so who in your career do you think are the people you've most looked up to in, I guess, your broad working life, really? Who's, yeah. who's inspired you? That's really good. I'm actually really inspired at the moment. I mean, it sounds a bit corny, um, but my chief exec and chairman at Surrey, um, they are, how do I describe them? They they have pushed me to grow. So learning, you know, how do you manage your time better? How do you think strategically better? What's so nice about working with them is how strong their values are. They're very caring about people and progressing people and you know when it's if you go to them about women's cricket it's in their DNA to want it to be the best it can be you know they are so forward thinking and so I think I'm always around them whenever I work with them just soaking up how they go about business you know the club is has been very successful historically you know and and from even from a commercial perspective and I think I just listen and soak up from them how they go about business how they go about building teams and just the values that they drive that with. Other what people, are their names? Oh, sorry. sorry, Richard Gould and Richard Thompson. So they're our chief exec and chairman. So I'm I'm constantly soaking up and learning from them. I think I'm always motivated just generally, you know, like someone like Denise Lewis, who I remember watching her as a kid win the heptathlon, and then she's become a friend now. And I just, one, she's just always got energy. She's always, you know, she looks younger than... 20, you know, she looks 20, yeah, even though she's got four kids, she's maintained an amazing career. She's always got something to say on important issues. So someone like her, I'm just always looking to as a, not only was I inspired as a kid, sometimes you meet your heroes and they're just not what you think they are. She was everything you thought. And I just, I don't know, she's just got so much energy for life that I think, right, you know, Denise, you're inspiring me. I'm on that, I'm on that, that wavelength. And then I would say, I'm, I don't know, there's so many people who've inspired me throughout my journey. You know, like I mentioned, Jenny Wastrack, my one-to-one coach, people like that. But I would say people, like like I said, now it's about sort of the next level and what I'm trying to achieve strategically. And I think I'm soaking up from people like Richard and, and Richard about those sort of things. Excellent. And you've clearly had massive success. So just finally, what advice would you give to young women coming through and wanting to progress in the sports sector? today god i would still say believe in yourself because and you know maybe people it sounds so corny but i've done a lot of work you know i said i didn't believe in psychology before now i have a session every two weeks for myself as a growth thing because i think what i've realized is the more i've unlocked belief in myself the more you put yourself forward for opportunities the more when you get the opportunity you maximize it the more you grow in confidence and i think just because of history of the world and you know biases and all those sort of things women we still have a little bit of work to do for ourselves to to do that so I'll say two things I would say one 
build your confidence. And the other is always work on a good environment. I think you could be a really good, smart person, but if you're in the wrong company or you're in the wrong team or you're in the wrong environment, it's not going to work for you. Everything that's around you can double or triple your success. I could have had a vision for women's cricket, but been at the wrong county and they didn't value it and we wouldn't have been able to make a difference. So two things, work on building yourself up and your confidence and that will always grow. And then the other is just get around really good people in good environments. So much wise advice from Ebony. I've no doubt we'll all be feeling more confident in our approach to life and work having listened to her. If you're enjoying the Game Changers, it would be great if you could take a moment to rate and review the podcast. These ratings make a really big difference to how the podcast is ranked and how likely other people are to find the stories of these incredible women. Thanks again to Sport England for supporting this series of the Game Changers and also to Sam Walker, my rather brilliant executive producer. You can find out more about all 41 of my incredible guests from this and the previous series at fearlesswomen.co.uk or come and say hello on social media where you'll find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at Sue Anstis or at The Game Changers. Next week, I'll be talking to Katie Salier, General Manager of Women's Rugby at World Rugby. A former Olympian in the pool, Katie led the transformation of New Zealand's high-performance sports system and in 2016 received a Lifetime Achievement Award for her contribution to sport in New Zealand over the past 25 years. Please be sure to subscribe now so you don't miss this episode. On the day that they signed off on the eight-year strategy, we changed the governance structure of World Rugby and brought on 17 women directors. So from zero to 36% just like that. And so when people say things like that can't happen, they certainly can happen. The Game Changers. Fearless Women in Sport.